jump right in. I've got a lot to do today, and uh, hopefully I leave you with enough missing information that you search these things out for yourself and uh, enjoy the, the study and the learning that can come from these things. Um, so we're looking at uh, the beginning and the end, creation, consummation, the beginning of this world to the end of it. And what does that look like? And I said yesterday those are two um, topics that people kind of avoid because they're controversial or uh, mysterious or we don't have a good understanding of those things and so we kind of avoid those things. And I'm challenging you to press in, to lean in to that uh, conflict, that debate, not necessarily the debate with an evolutionist, but the, the debate even within the church. I think that's actually a more dangerous uh, misinformation possibility is within the church and how we're uh, watering down scripture and how we have a tendency to try to uh, get friends from the outside or from the evolutionary world and, and um, bring them in and water down what we believe to be true about Scripture. So that's what we're looking at. I'm not, typically I try to review a, a lot, um, but I don't have time to do that. So I'll send you the notes if you want them. Who remembers the, the first, there's three big questions that everyone has an answer to, um, whether they know it or not. Um, there's three big questions of life, I believe. There's probably a lot more to it than this, but what are the, what's the first big question in life that everybody needs an answer to? Where did that come from? Where did that come from? Very good. And there's two kind of tracks that need to be followed all the way down. And this is what we miss when we present just evolution to our kids in school. We miss um, the, the whole line of logic. And that's what I want to show a little bit of you um, today. There's basically two tracks. One is a supernatural worldview that believes um, in a god or a, a creator, a designer, intelligent design, um, falls into all of that, and that there was some sort of a supernatural interaction um, between God and, and this earth and people on this earth. And then there's a natural uh, explanation, uh, typically beginning with the Big Bang or some cataclysmic event. Um, there's actually there's a, a, some theories out there, probably 5% that believe in some sort of uh, alien, uh, you know, kind of view or whatever, but somehow that this came about naturally. Actually, the alien view would actually be over on our side, I believe it, but um, we don't typically go there. So um, the, super, uh, the natural world view has to answer these questions. And so that's what we started with yesterday. Where did we come from with the naturalistic worldview? They don't really have a good explanation from that. A biblical worldview would say that we came from God and that we are created in his image, reflecting his nature, and that origin determines identity. The big piece of who I am is determined by where I came from. In fact, I say all of it, a lot of it. Even if I would say, I, I don't want to be like my parents in this way, that still determines how I act and how I live. There's a determination in there that either I'm like them or I'm not like them. But it's still, my, my origin determines the way I respond to things today. Okay, let's jump down here to the second question. What was the second question? Why am I here? Why am I here? So first, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we've got to get to the good stuff. But I want to just ask this. What does a naturalistic worldview offer us in the realm of meaning or purpose in life? Not much, but it does offer some things, right? What is, how does the evolution process work? What are some evolutionary terms that could possibly provide me some purpose? Survival. Survival of the fittest. You've heard this term before, right? Part of my purpose, if I believe in a naturalistic worldview, to answer this second big question of life, is to survive. Not a bad thing, right? We all in here want to live. Hopefully we can live through the hypothermia we're experiencing in this room. But we want to survive. So survival 
of the fittest. That's an interesting concept. We'll talk about that in a minute. So one of my purposes is to make it, according to this, just to live, right? And to survive, which is, I think, the bottom of life, right? And you hear people talk like this, right? How you doing? I'm just surviving. <laughs> Sometimes you hear this in the church, too. Is that really what God had planned for us? To just survive? No. He, he, he expects and has granted us life and abundance and blessing and honor and privilege and responsibility and stewardship. I'm getting ahead of myself. But that's what it has to offer. What's the other big thing that's a part of the evolution theory as far as meaning and purpose? Reproduction. Those are my two big pieces according to the evolution theory, right? Survive and reproduce. Is there anything else in biology that evolution can offer us, or a naturalistic worldview, as far as meaning and purpose. What about if somebody said, well, I, I believe in evolution, and I believe I'm here to survive and produce, but I also uh, want to do good in this world. I want to be kind to others. What's the problem with that statement? Why? This Why? What else? It doesn't serve your benefit. I mean, evolution is about being the fittest on top, always. Yeah, logically, we have some problems with that. Plus, where does the concept of good come from? God. God. Where in biology, <coughs> where in DNA structure, where in physics or mathematics is the moral concept of good? going to be hard pressed to find it. In fact, morality is determined by me. There is no higher moral good. There really is no evil. It's just we're just doing the best we can with life. So what they're trying to do is what Christians try to do with evolution. We try to borrow some things from evolution and say, well, can't really explain some scientific things I'm hearing. So I want to borrow from the evolution side and bring theistic evolution in. We can't do that, I don't believe, logically or correctly to divine scripture. They can't borrow from our side either. God is good. God is the lawgiver. God brings the concepts of good and evil to the table. There is no place in biology for the concept of good and evil. So when they say that, I believe that people naturally, I think there is some things in people that don't believe in God that desire to do good and to sacrifice and work for the Peace Corps and help people who are in need and lay down their lives sometimes. But I don't believe that that fits with the evolutionary model where my goal is to survive. So what I think that they've done my understanding from having many conversations with people who believe this way is that they have to borrow that concept from a biblical worldview because it's not in there. It's just not there. So other than if you just take a strict naturalistic worldview, my purpose is to reproduce and to survive. And when my reproduction time is over and I begin and I'm not adding to the gene pool anymore and I'm not um, benefiting society, what is my purpose then? To die, right? And to provide carbon and energy for the circle of life, right? A little bit of lion thing in there? So yes, it actually be better for me once I'm done reproducing, and I am, <laughs> probably too much information, but once I stop, have stopped adding, or whatever, whatever your opinion is of what I did for the gene pool, uh, once I'm, done with that, I'm taking up resources for the next generation. 
right? I'm using water. I'm creating. It, that's true. This is very true. And do you see that philosophy? Should we be surprised when you hear people talk about using it? That abortion is all right. Hitler loved this concept. Stalin loved this concept that there are people on this planet that need to be exterminated. And in the evolutionary theory, in the evolutionary worldview, death is a good thing. It's necessary for the continuation of life for the rest of us that want to survive. Your death, disease, is a good thing. Mutation is a good thing. I don't believe that. And I think we fight against those things. It's interesting to me that we fight so hard against those things when really our philosophy that we're teaching our kids is this is what needs to happen. We really need to get out of the way. What you want to have happen in the evolutionary theory is rapid reproduction. You want to move as quickly as you can through the genetic code to get to a better place. And so all that we're doing to prolong life kind of is surprising to me. But not really, because I think that God put that within us. Uh, my belief is God put within us a value of life. And that life is valuable. But that comes from God, not the evolution theory, where death is the means. Okay. I got a question. Yes. <laughs> so I'm going to gate myself and into that. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, this. Yeah, I don't even. I, I don't even have time to get into that. Here's what I would say. My definition of of um, marriage comes from Genesis chapter one, chapter two, and the rest of the Bible that explains all of that. And I don't. I don't believe God changed changes his mind. But what she's saying is, is that you can't reproduce. Oh. That, that was my point. Yes. If, if, right. there's, no, if there's no, there's no reproduction, yes, why are they allowed? Okay. <laughs> Yes, it makes it very difficult. That's an excellent question. And and I don't know how they answer that other than trying to borrow from or just seeking their own satisfaction and happiness. Um, and and they they probably don't think through that like like we are trying to. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so that's the naturalistic worldview. What does the Bible say? about purpose and meaning. Am I just taking up space, using oxygen, and paying bills? I hope not. God gave me more than that. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Get your Bible out if you have them. I'm going to show it up here as well. Because I want you to see this. I would encourage you, though, to, I don't know if you mark up your Bible, I encourage you to underline some of this in your, in your Bible. This is the New International Version for this. So we just started yesterday saying God um, created man. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So that what? What's well, first of all, let me stop. Our first purpose, if we were made in the image of God, what is our first purpose? What is our primary purpose if we are in the image of God and God is in relationship to himself since before time began? Relationship. Love, relationship, fellowship. I'm going to put it this way. Our number one purpose on this earth, and this is for the entire world, is to be in relationship with God. Is this not the first commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Our first 
task, duty, responsibility, purpose is to be in relationship with God and man, with each other. That's just because we were made in His image. We were made for a relationship. You can't do this alone. No man is an island. You didn't pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Somebody helped you. We were made to be in a relationship. That's the first thing. Then he gave them some other things to do. What did he give them to do? Care for the land. Care for the land. What else? Reproduce. Reproduce. That was God's idea. <coughs> Build the earth. Subdue it. It doesn't mean ruin it. Subdue in the sense of a steward, right? We're a steward of this earth. We're a steward of the talents that he's given to us. We're a steward of life. A steward over every living creature that moves on the ground. He gives us the plants, every tree. He's naming these things. God saw that he had made and it was good. Let's move to... There's a ton in here, but I'm, I've got to move on to get through this. Genesis 2. He, um, he moves the message on this one. This is really cool. So he says it again. He goes through, I love this, Heaven and earth were finished down to the last detail. By the seventh day, God had finished his work. On the seventh day, he rested from all his work. He blessed the seventh day, and he made it holy. First thing he made holy, by the way, was this day. Because on that day he rested from his work. All the creating God had done. Then there's this line in the message. I love how it says it. This is the story of how it all started. Of heaven and earth when they were created. The how matters. How God created this matters. Just like, and I'm, I'm going to just throw something out here. Pastors, you can make a message out of this if you want to. How Jesus died on the cross, how Jesus died for our sins matters. He could have chosen any period of history to come and sacrifice his son. If I was God, or I was Jesus, and I wanted to die for my people that I had created, I would choose America lethal injection, frankly, for a better way, an easier way to die. He chose the Roman world and the most horrific way to die for my sins. How it matters. How he created this world. The story of how he created it means something. And we can't just get into that mode that he died for my sins. He created the world. It really doesn't matter how he did it. Yes, it does. It does matter how he did it. Because he cares about the details. He cares about me. He cares about this life. And he was willing to, to suffer the most cruel death <coughs> to save me from my sins. He didn't have to do it that way. He chose to do it that way. The how matters. This is the story of how it all started at the earth when they were created. That was free. I didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> so he goes through he tells the how he's, he's describing um, the garden that he planted I think that's really cool too I, I love that picture of God he didn't just throw down plants and animals he planted the garden I love that, that picture <laughs> so he took the man set him down in the garden of Eden to work the ground and keep it in order he's a God of order that again shows his purpose he says you can eat from any tree in the garden. He gives Adam a job. He gives Adam a task. What was the specific task that he gave to Adam besides just generally take care of the earth and be in relationship with me, be in relationship with Eve? What was the specific task that he gave to Adam? Name the animals. Tend the garden specifically and name the animals. So he gave him specific tasks. And I, I believe he gave Adam the talents and the tools and the ability to do that task. And he did it. Um, okay, I'll move that up. 
head. There's so many thoughts going through my head. Um, you gave him a task. So my, I look at that and I think, all right, God, what does that mean for me? Because that's really the point. I don't really care what he did for Adam so much as he's setting down a pattern for me. He's telling me what he did for Adam, and, he, and then he's setting down a pattern for us. He designed me to be in a relationship, first of all, with him, and then with the people that he's put in my life. And I believe he's created me for a task. He's, he's designed a task specifically for me. Maybe multiple tasks throughout my life. And so my life is going to be spent, is being spent, finding what that task is. And saying, God, what do you have for me to do? What have you designed me for? What talents have you given me? What situations have you given me? that I can honor you by, by doing that task and doing it well. That gives me meaning. That gives me purpose in life. Because I'm now I'm not just surviving, and I'm not just reproducing, it's a piece of it, but I am finding the task that God made for me. I would challenge you with that. What is the task? Why did God put me on this earth in Indiana or Ohio or wherever I live, Michigan. You can believe that people actually live in Michigan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just lost a few. So. Yeah, right. Okay, that's good. You. You're a missionary to Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let me go back to this. Let's wrap this up, and then we'll get to the good stuff. The Bible says I'm here to be in relationship. Again, I'll send this to you if you want it. Just email me and ask for it. I've been given gifts and abilities and passions by God. He has a specific task for me. I'm different than the animals. Remember how yesterday we talked about his creation, the act of creation seemed to take a pause. And he said, let us make man in our image. I'm a steward of this earth and the talents that he gave me. I feel if I'm going to choose, and I get to choose, right? I get to choose which one of these I believe. I choose this. Can I prove that this is right and true scientifically? No, I can't. I can't prove that this one's right and scientific either. I have to believe either one of these. I choose to believe this. This gives me purpose and meaning in this life. The other one, I'm a product of beneficial mutations and survival of the fittest. I'm a highly evolved hominid, part of the animal kingdom. I do not have to answer to a high, higher authority. I am it. Don't people live this way? When you look around, don't you see people living this way? I'm here to survive and pass on genetic material. Sometimes I get the idea that some of the people I meet, that's all they're doing. <laughs> and they don't seem to be in my opinion. You get to choose. Now we're gonna, so, what is my task? This is one of my favorite quotes. When the love relationship with God is right, He is free to give you assignments at His initiative. Whenever you do not seem to be receiving assignments from God, focus on the love relationship until the assignment. People say, I don't know what God has for me. That's fine. Focus on the love relationship. He will give you one. He gave Adam one. He's giving me one. He's going to do it. He's faithful. He's prepared you for something. If you do not seem to be getting assignments, you do, I don't know what God's will is for my life. There's some unclarity in my future. That's fine. That's okay. Focus on the love relationship. The assignment's going to come. with that. Let's go to I'm going to switch slideshows so you're going to see this a little prettier. Where am I going? The final question. We've got a half an hour. We've got 25 minutes. I can do this. 
Direction and destination. I saw this on Facebook a little while ago. This is how people live, right? I don't know where I'm going. I don't know why I'm here. What does the naturalistic worldview give us for where am I going when I die? What's next? Decomposition. Nothing. Decomposition. The circle of life. I'm taking a dirt nap. Pushing posies. <laughs> farm. Okay. That is it. There is nothing beyond this life in a naturalistic worldview. There is no heaven. There is no hell. There's no reincarnation. There's no second shot. It is over. There is nothing. Your destination, just like your origin, determines how you, your identity and how you live. Your destination determines how you live. Your destination for camp determines how you pack. If your destination is the grocery store, you're going to pack differently than you pack to come to camp. How you prepare for that trip is determined by where you're going. If you're going to spend the next two years in France, you're going to pack differently than you pack to go to work, or you just pack a lunch. Your destination determines how you live in this life. If my destination is nothing, the ground, what does that say about the way that I need to live my life? Live it up. Doesn't matter. I'm not going to answer to anybody for this life. Might as well enjoy it while I'm here. I get one shot. YOLO, right? You only live once. Live it up. Do whatever feels good. Survive. Reproduce. Or die. And I work in a school with troubled kids. And we've lost 16 kids in the last 11 years to death. Most of those, they've taken their own life which is the logical end to a naturalistic worldview. If there's, if I didn't come from anything, and I'm not going anywhere, and this life stinks, frankly, why would I keep doing it? And I'm gonna end my life. I talked to somebody a week ago that said I was ready to kill myself. Somebody walked in and stopped me. I didn't see any purpose. I didn't see any purpose. I didn't see any meaning. That's for real. And that's the logical end. If, if we really take God out of the picture and design and purpose and meaning and a destination that means something, the only natural conclusion is death. Why wouldn't it? Or I'm gonna live everything that I I'm gonna live every minute for me. I'm gonna make life the best that I can because this is it. You see people living that way. They're either dying or they're living for themselves. That's why I think it's so dangerous to try to borrow from this worldview as a Christian. Why on earth would we ever take the hopelessness from this worldview and try to frame it into God's way of putting this earth together? Why would we ever do that? I don't get it, frankly. So, I'm not going to spend any more time there unless somebody has anything to add. There, there is nothing. There is nothing that it offers. And I wish we would say this in school. Okay, if we believe in evolution, here's what happens when you die. Nothing. Wow, oh, gee, that's a downer. We're not worry about that. Let's just talk about what we have, what we know right here and now. No, let's tell them the beginning, let's tell them the end, let's tell them the whole picture. That's, that's one of my tasks on this earth, I think. God has given me. And I've had the opportunity to do that often at the school that I work with, with public school kids, if you can believe it. Heaven. So, the church, we've done a really poor job of understanding heaven. I think. And here's why. You have stuff like this. Come on. <laughs> 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 what is our view of heaven according to this kind of stuff? Boring. Boring. Sitting on a cloud, playing a harp. harp. Raise your hand if you listened to harp music in the last week. Okay. Occasionally I've listened to harp music. I like when I do, but I can't imagine 
eternity in <laughs> <laughs> the heart music. What else do we think heaven is? What? Well, unfortunately, people think you become angels, okay. and they're watching you. Right, right. Cherubs, you know, angels. Here's these guys sitting on snakes. <laughs> can't uh, see it or perceive it, why am I going to spend any time worrying about what heaven's going to be like? I'll just hope that I make it there and, you know, sounds kind of boring. Maybe it's, um, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Streets of Gold, that sounds kind of neat. Um, but I can't really understand it, so why would I spend any time thinking about it, reading about it, studying about what heaven is going to be like? What's verse 10 say? God revealed these things to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, for who knows a person's thought except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit that is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spirit words, with spirit taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness. The world considers this foolishness, what we're talking about today. Cannot understand them because they are discerned, discerned only through the Spirit. We can know these things. He's just, he's, he's not keeping them secret from us. So, let's look at it. Let's look at what does the Bible actually say about where we're going. Because what is the point of all this? I want to read one thing from Randy Alcorn. If you haven't read anything by Randy Alcorn, you need to. It's amazing. This is a collection of um, quotes and thoughts about heaven. I assume that 